fall day. It's sunny and warm, yet also breezy and shady, and we have so many wonderful people here, so thank you for coming out. I'm, my name is Lisa Vijos, and I'm a poet here in Sheboygan, and I'm the unofficial or official uh, organizer of 100,000 Poets for Change, which is a worldwide movement that started in 2011. So this is our seventh annual event. and. Um, always on the last Saturday of September in cities just like ours all over the world, poets and musicians and artists are coming together and the mission of these gatherings is to, to be together to promote and foster and, and encourage peace and justice and love and sustainability and just the expression of all of our hearts together in one place. So, thank you for coming out to share, and we have a really long and wonderful open mic lineup. I think there's already like 20 people on the list. So I'm going to ask people if you brought more than, I think we should just start with one poem each, if that works for you. We're gonna keep it moving during the first hour from one to two, and then we have a featured reader um, he's not here yet, but the Poet Laureate of Milwaukee, Roberto Harrison, is coming up, and I'll be introducing him a little bit later in the show. And then we'll hear more, some more music from John Dahl at the end to, to send us off on our day with full hearts. But first, before we start the open mic, uh, John and I said, let's have one song to kind of kick everything off. So John, I'm gonna have you come back. Wait, let me see one thing. I want to thank Mead Public Library for hosting us. And um, I also want to point out to you the wonderful artwork on the window and on the fence. Um, that was, those artworks were made by high school and middle school students at Etude School. And we want to thank them for their wonderful work. And we will be starting off with a song and then the open mic and then I will introduce our featured poet in just a little bit or in about an hour so <laughs> go. so I thought it would be appropriate to start a song about someone who uh, the person who wrote this song it was an old was a slave trader back in the 1600s, I think, 1700s maybe. And uh, he wrote the song after he uh, reformed himself. And it's one I'm sure you'll all recognize and you're welcome to sing along. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
shining as the sun. We've no last days to sing God's praise than for when first we into the open mic now and I'm gonna ask there's probably 20 people on the list to read so we're gonna do one poem each if you can all right we're gonna keep it short although we do have one person who's got a 26 word poem and I told him he could do, do two so if you have a <laughs> poem that's very very short you can do two um, but right now I'd like to invite my friend Ali Guevara up Alexandra Guevara and we're going to read a poem together in two languages it's it's a poem I wrote and uh, she's going to do Spanish. I'm going to do English. Hi. Good morning. <laughs> good afternoon. Buenos, buenos dias. Buenos sí, dias. Buenos, buenas tardes. <laughs> oh, es tarde. Ya es tarde. So, we st I start. You start. En solidaridad. En solidarity. Vistos de arriba, somos una miriada de pequeños círculos. Seen from above. We are a myriad of small circles. Nos movemos por las calles como células sanguíneas en las venas. We move through the streets like blood cells in veins. Balanceándonos en nuestro camino hacia el corazón de la materia. Bobbing our way in and through to the heart of the matter. Nos hacemos conocer como el sistema colectivo. We make ourselves known as a collective system. Trabajamos para mantener el cuerpo vivo y sano. We work to keep the greater body alive and healthy. Trabajamos para alejarnos de lo que nos podría aniquilar. We work to keep at bay that which would try to annihilate us. Nos unimos en las arterias alrededor del planeta. We band together in arteries all over the planet. Todos los sistemas fluyendo hacia un fin común. All systems flowing toward a common goal. Hablar, ser escuchados y escuchar. To speak, to be heard, to listen. Fluimos como agua, como vino, como sangre. We flow like water, like wine, like blood. Cada uno único, cada uno conexo. Each one unique, each one connected. Cuando ignoramos nuestras pequeñas discrepancias y nos mantenemos unidos, When we ignore our small discrepancies and remain united, no podemos fallar. We cannot fail. Crecemos como una marea. We surge like a tide. Prevaleceremos. We will prevail. Thank you. Gracias. Muchas gracias. Thank you, Ali. So, our next reader at the open mic is Betsy Alice. Betsy, come on up. Thanks, Lisa. Um, you know, probably a lot of you have heard this poem, but it just hit me this morning. So I thought, I, I'm going to get up and read it. Uh, it. It's upside down now. Oh, there we go. It's called The Peace of Wild Things, and it's by one of my favorite authors, Wendell Berry. When despair grows in me and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. 
I come into the presence of still water, and I feel above me the day-blind stars waiting for their light. For a time, I rest in the grace of the world, and I am free. Thank you, Betsy and Wendell. Next up is Bobby Lovell. I'm Bobby Lovell. I just drove in from Deep Pier, but I grew up in Sheboygan. So I, I'm going to read a poem um, called Fog Advisory, Janu January 20th, 1917. And that, of course, was Inauguration Day. Um, and some of us might recall that for many of us in Wisconsin, there is fog that lasted for days about that time. And I wrote this poem um, for um, any non-poets in the group. This form is called a pantoum, and it relies on a lot of repetition. Fog Advisory, January 20th, 2017. Fog descends, no horizon, no stars to wish upon. We drive into fallen sky, feet heavy on the gas. No stars to wish upon tonight, no sure thing. Heavy hearts need gas, yet we cannot stop tonight, one sure thing. All the edges blur, and we can't stop them. We must remember how the edges blurred, where this road leads. We must remember how truth once looked. Where does this lead? Are we speeding or still? How does one look truth in the eye and lie? Are we speeding or still spinning our wheels? The mind's eye lies beyond gray, sees all. World keeps spinning, fog descends. No horizon, only gray, yet we see. We drive into fallen sky. Thank you, Bobby. All right, next up is Tad Fippenwenty. Hello. Um, <laughs> I'm very lucky to teach at the Etude High School. Uh, the Etude schools are great, and some of my students will be reading later. But um, I'm trying a different poem for me today. I was thinking about poets for change. You know, what do I want changed? I want to stop seeing prescription drug commercials on television during the dinner hour. That's the main thing. Also, there's an irony in how eager human beings are to kill each other, to shoot each other. I, th I believe we're the only species that kills one another for no apparent reason. And that makes me sad. So things like that I'd like changed. We have enough against us already. So this poem is about some of the things we cannot change. And I also want to ask how many of you have ever been to a carnival? You know, the real carnival. OK. This poem is called Catalyst for Carnival. All of the pill bottles stand open on the counter. Her cancered mind cannot fathom what this means, what to choose. She tugs a ring of scarf from her head, pulls back and tosses the ring onto amber plastic cylinders, hoping for the goldfish with the bulging eyes, lovely fins, wide mouth. The carny pulls at his cigarette through gnarled fingers, coughs her another toss, the ring clattering on a counter of spilled pills, tilting, missing, until she chooses with both hands a pair of fish, one white, one orange, and another pair, the black, the multicolored, moving. She swallows each wiggler like soft, wet candy, small scoops of cool custard sliding down her throat, one before another until she has eaten five, they feel alive, then seven, then ten goldfish downed, more than her brother ever could at this goldfish eating contest. And the carny hands on her shoulders, hands her the big fluffy bear or blanket, and leans her backward until her eyes click closed like her first doll, and she sleeps there in the arms of the fair. What is fair? All the fish she swallows make her feel alive, feel better, feel the so feel soft 
powder between her teeth, like pixie sticks and sweethearts, like potato chips crumbling salty in her belly. Did you take your pills today? No. I went to the carnival. She is dreaming her long blonde hair and lets a boy bite a candy from her necklace. The cotton is spinning pink, spinning blue. She stands open on the counter, one white, one orange, the multicolored scarf around her bare head. Hello, I'm Jane Katzbaum, and uh, this is for Peace and Justice. It's called Color Matters. Color matters in leaves, flags, and stoplights. Color matters in house paints, lipsticks, and road signs. Color does not matter in the skin of people, in the military, in baseball, in teachers, in poets. The color of skin does not matter in reporters, presidents, Miss USA winners, friends. Color does look lovely in gardens. Thank you, Jane. Oh, it's okay, John. I'll <laughs> stand on my tiptoes. Um, let's see. Next up is Jackson Close. Jackson, are you out there? Yes, come on up. And Jackson, you're a student at Etude, right? Yep. yep. Okay. There you go. Mike is yours. Very head appropriate. Okay. Okay. Very small space. Cool. Uh, this is um, entitled The Fault in Wait, That's Not What This Is About Stars. Cool. Let's go. One, choose to run away from your problems. Two, remember all the animals you left behind. Three, it may be time to look for a new place. Four, 400 square feet just isn't cutting it anymore. Five, recall the chips you left on your pleather couch. Six, you're poor. Seven, the busted remnants of those deep-fried potatoes are probably plastered across the whiskers of those feline faces. Eight, their faces lingering with sorrow because you have the audacity to run away with such cowardice. Nine, metal frames rattle below your sandal-clad feet. Ten, the PA sounds. Eleven, T minus two minutes. 12, quickly, there is no time to spare. 13, rush to the chair. 14, strap in. 15, remember, it's the law. 16, wow, who knew NASA had such comfy seats? 17, T minus five. 18, Brace for liftoff. 19, 4, 3, 2, 20. Avoid letting your sweat seep into the rad chairs aboard the spacecraft. 21, collect yourself. 22, black out. 23, seems like you forgot 21. 24, is this what it feels like? 25, space travel. 26, awake to an endless amazement and stimulus loneliness that the vast chasm of outer space can only provide. 27, a paper lies in front of you. 28, this many as well be the time to do some light reading. 29, open listicle. Four things you're not gonna believe about colonization. 30, along the edge of the printout, there's a URL 
to which friend's character are you? 31. Fall into a deep nostalgic depression about the 90s. 32. Cheer yourself up. 33. There could be nothing better than bettering yourself. 34. Right? 35. Read page. 36. 1. Near speed of light travel velocity from light. 37. As you read the article, you find that you you find a sticky note. 38. Really high tech, NASA. 39. On the dashboard in front of you. 40. Laser powered spacecraft and cargo. 41. Ship with care. 42. Continue reading. 43. Even though light is this massless particle, it still has momentum. 44. That old ninth grade mnemonic buzzes around your brain. 45. Mo mass, mo velocity, momentum. 46. Minus that tricky mass part. 47. Quantum physics. Not your best subject. 48. This laser sail powered by the Dew Star Array completed a few years ago will power your colonization project. 49. Oddly direct for a listicle. 50. Plants will be propelled a light week to assist colonies on K-53 in mere days. 51. Press a giant red button to deploy package. 52. Warning. Package be contains fragile materials. 53. Safety above everything else. 54. Upon deployment of package, button press will trigger a deep slumber until destination is reached. 55. There is not time to waste now. 56. 180 trillion miles await ahead of you and those food-bearing seeds attached to the sails. 57. Smash button aggressively out of indecisiveness. 58. You awake to find a dense forest just outside the thick metal shielding surrounding your pod. 59. Oh, how time flies. 60. But a thought crosses your mind. 61. How can there be plants? Living plants. 62. For plants, there must be air. 63. And for air, there must be something to keep it from being ejected into space. 64. Pull out Lustrical from travel. 65. Read 2 and 3. 66. So you think you can plant, and the big air theory. 68. These selections point to the presence of a magnetic field. 69. Be glad you weren't a whiz in physics class. 70. Regret not studying more. 71. Take note of the large spinning wire in the sky attached to a ground-bound solar panels. 72. Join your new friends. 73. Well, 
acquaintances. 74. Okay, fine. The people you're going to be nice to because NASA doesn't like cats in space. 75. Some ethical problems or something. 76. You've never been such a larger believer in science and the innate human desire for exploration. 77. Just pray that that, that large wire doesn't stop spinning. 78. And don't step outside the strong parts of the field. 79. Remember, safety above everything else. Jackson, thank you. Thank you. Next up is Nancy Durden. I'm going to read what inspired my poem first, which is really short, but it was written by Richard Wilbur. All that we do is touched with ocean, and yet we remain on the shore of what we know. Survival in the deep. So start walking forward in tiny steps, at first stumbling and unsure, then haltingly with bigger steps, then water up to your knees, maybe muddy water, then up to your waist. You start feeling the tug of the current pulling on your legs. When the water is almost to your neck with a current that threatens to pull you under if you keep going, just keep going. But now start fighting. Use your arms and your legs and everything you have. Believe and you will learn how to survive in deep and treacherous waters because you must to go on living, learn how to survive, not just from wading in placid pools. also a student at the Etude School and so glad to be there to have teachers like Tad. Um, and this is something I wrote a little over a year ago. We speak only in anagrams, digging teeth into tongues, squinting until our eyelids become mirrors and our lips dust-covered records spinning steadily. You plant a garden in careful rows, tomatoes, rutabaga, purple carrots, never intersecting, never intertwining their roots. We follow a similar choreography. I hand you yellowing newspaper clippings from 11 years ago, and you pin them to the wall. They are all the same 26 letters rearranged. <laughs> I was talking in the back. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Okay, where are we? Marion Hurt. You all remember Smokey the Bear? Hey, Smokey. It's my book from uh, 60 some years ago. Okay. <laughs> this is no more Mr. Nice Bear. I know you heard my story, how a big old fire took out my mother and me, all singed to paws and fur, got sent to Washington, the National Zoo. Quite the celebrity I became. Folks sending me honey, a song sung around a thousand campfires, how I, Smokey, could sniff the air, find a fire before it starts to flame. I gotta tell you, this living in the zoo wasn't all it was cracked up to be. But there I was, smack in the middle of the capital, in the middle of the US of A, and I always had myself a good pair of ears. You think I'm gone now? Just my picture coming into towns, fire warnings, low, medium, high. But here's the deal, I still got power. And this playing with fire better give you pause because my adopted city is ready to blow up and this fire shows no favors and we are all gonna burn. And yes, I will haunt you the rest of your days. Oh. <laughs> the future holds all you see is fear of what's to come when you look at the past all you see is all you see is anger hate and regret because of the mistakes you made or the choices you did or did not make 
when you look at what's going on around you now and you make the right choices, you can make the future and the past less scary. And it makes the past just as, just as less hard and regretful. The past and the future are there to guide your choices and to better your choices so you don't make the same mistakes twice. If you make fewer mistakes, then looking at the past can motivate you, and looking at the future seems just as motivating. Just remember you are your own future because of your past. Just focus on the now, and your past will glow as bright as a smile. Excellent job. She said she was nervous, but she did great. Thank you. Um, Gail. Gail. Gail Knapp? This is called the Wonders of the Fall. Of all the things you wish you'd never done, what's number one? Saying something you'd regret, another I'm not ready yet. Things you wish you'd done, what's number one? A conversation long gone, a star you wish you'd wished upon, meanings making, meanings mistaken, a risk never taken, it happens to us all, the wonders of the fall. Thank you. I'm so happy to have lots of young people here today, and some are reading for the first time. So let's give them a hand because it's really important to do. Um, next up is Tony Mariani. Excuse me. In 1987, I began working in a, in a children's emergency department in a, a mid-sized city. Most nights, um, they were bringing in young bodies of young men killed by gang members. Rival gangs were having um, wars. And as we know, in Chicago and Milwaukee, those are the two major cities we hear about it continuing, but it goes on. It goes on. In 1993, in that same emergency department, my 15-year-old son was brought in one night. In my grief, I wrote a song that I incorporated this year, January, into my first self-published novel, a three-part series. It's called Chain to Love. It's about slavery and my family's history. But um, so what's sad is modern time issues can be relatable to the past. So I just used my song of grief for my lost child in gang warfare to my great grandparents' history. Medea began to hum and then sing the words of the slave warning song. Troubles are on the rise. We've got to stop them before more of our babies die. The answer is in our homes. Mamas, take a look and see what's wrong. Sometimes we seem to hold the key to keeping our babies happy though not free. If more of our babies go astray, Lord, Lord, who's gonna be there to show us the way? There's got to be another way. There's got to be a better way. Let's look around and see what can be done. There's got to be another way. There's got to be a better way. Somebody run and get the master son. Thank you. Oh, thank you 
so much for sharing from your heart and singing for us today. Thank you for being here. Something must be done, right? Um, all right, more poetry. Ah, Sylvia Cavanaugh. Good afternoon. I'm a teacher at North High School, uh, and I'm originally from Pennsylvania. Thank you. This is Stone Boy of Appalachia. An oblong stone that was once a boy who angered a woman stares out from the end of the yard where auto frames on cinder blocks ease themselves to dust, their rusted coils offer up a nested last resistance. Lockjaw boy stands mute. City cousins run right past to picnic as their mothers sweep high on wooden swings, giggling into treetops girlishly, and later on to gawk, slack-jawed, at the strip-mined vein, scraped right down to the tendons of the town. Thank you, Sylvia. Ed Worstein, up next. A couple short announcements. I'm the East Region Representative for the Wisconsin Fellowship of Poets. You can find all the information about our organization. It's a statewide organization of uh, fellowship and support for poets, real conferences and readings and so on. It's uh, wfop.org. We put out a calendar every year. I have some copies of the 2018 calendar. They're uh, $10, but they're 15 if you buy them in the bookstore and they're laid out you know, in a week by week uh, format. I also have some flyers for the, there's a call out for poems for the 2019 calendar. The deadline is December 1st. The, it's going to be edited by uh, Fabu Carter, a Madison poet. And I have some in the folder here, so if you want one, just, uh, just see me later. I have a short poem and then a shorter poem. <laughs> this one is called uh, Magnesium Ash. And it starts with an epigram by a Cuban poet, Eberto Padilla. Speak the truth, at least speak your truth, and afterward, let anything happen. Let them tear apart your best manuscripts. Let them break down your door. Let people come in, crowd around your body like it was a miracle or just a corpse. Magnesium ash. You're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. I'm trying to impress this upon you, how dead you are. Only slightly less dead than you will be tomorrow, only slightly less dead than 10 years from now. And what of 100 years? Only slightly less dead, yet you're still able to speak. And here's the heart of what I want you to hear your very temporary ability to speak so that others might hear your truth. Your ability to speak an open window, a window open and closed in the magnesium flash of an old Kodak brownie. Your magnesium ash while your voice, a photograph, sounds forever. And uh, this, uh, this is a 26 word poem. And ABC Darium is a, a 26 line poem and if you read down the first letter it's the alphabet and I've been trying to write a 26 word ABC Darium and uh, this is uh, the result is called ABC Donald. <laughs> Arrogant, blowhard, conceited Donald, egotistically flaunts garish hair. I just know little men never outgrow preposterous quests. Reason sits terrorized under veils, watching xenophobic, yawping zealot. Thank you. Very nice 26 word abecedarian there. Thank you, Ed. Next is Emily Kamen. So 
I'm currently a student at um, UW Stevens Point, but I was a member of the Poetry Club at North High School, so thanks Ms. Camera for running that. This poem was called Love. I have never been in love. I don't know what it means to dedicate yourself to another person, to vow to stay together forever, to be married for 50 years and still remember the first time you saw him standing across the room. I don't know what it's supposed to feel like, this madness that makes you stumble over words until sentences intertwine, and the moment to say how you feel has passed, leaving you breathless and disappointed. But you smile anyway, because these things take practice. I don't know how it feels to have a first kiss, soft lips meeting like strangers, lingering for a moment before going their separate ways, and maybe meeting again sometime, if he fancies you and you like him. I don't know how it feels, but I know how it should be. So when he grabs you a little too hard and you brush it off, an accident after all, so when he hits you for the first time and you feel the pain boom across your face like shame. So when he gets inside your head and whispers, this is your fault, honestly, you deserve this. So when the fear of him becomes so strong you are his slave. So when everyone else but you can see how you become silent, like a shadow, just barely there only because he still thinks you're useful. So when your friends notice you wear long sleeve shirts to hide his marks, branding you like cattle, claiming you as his, and question why you still stay with him. Think twice before you answer, because he loves me. Love feels like sunshine in your soul, buoyancy in your steps. He has stolen that, turned it dark. I have never known what it is to be in love, but I know what you should be feeling, how he should be treating you. This is not supposed to be a one-way street where he steals the light and gives you the dark when he calls to apologize recognize that he doesn't mean it. This is a loop that never ends. It is a song of horror on repeat, but you can turn off the radio and cut the chain. I may not know love well, but I know enough to say run while you still can. We do not need another young girl covered in a white sheet, killed in the name of what she claimed was love. Thank you. You've been coming for a few years now, and you're really growing as a poet, and that was, that was beautiful. I mean, intense. Thank you for sharing. Okay, we're on to page two of the list, people. Angelica? Jaden? Why do his friends insist on leading him down the wrong path, stopping at nothing to incessantly pull him off center, grabbing onto his very being and soul. Who are you? This is a question we all ask. Why do they insist on telling him that he's lying, that he's not really who he thinks he is? Why does this generation stop at nothing to do everything that their parents told them not to do? Many of the boys in this generation are womanizers, tearing apart the very relationships that they say they want and blaming it on everyone else. They say they watch that unspeakable thing and wonder why he doesn't. They wear a shameful act like a badge of honor. They wear it as if it distinguishes men from boys. We first asked ourselves this in fifth grade when you had to do a project on yourself. The rule asked, what did your name mean? You looked it up. When you did, you found the definition. It didn't match who you are. It said things that made us want that to be us, yet it didn't match. The project had us write down all of our perfections, and if we wrote down our imperfections, our teacher would judge, yet we know everyone has flaws, as if our perfections made us grow versus what we went through, and no, frankly, we'd rather some things because we don't want that awkward silence. I think he's gay. Yeah, I've thought that for a while. Yeah, he must be. And they have no sympathy. They say it was a joke, but the boy knows it wasn't. The second time we asked this was when we were in the middle of middle school, trying to figure out which crowd to be in, where to sit for lunch. When our bodies were changing, so did our brains. In middle school, we wore clothes that maybe we didn't like, but everyone had them. 
Maybe if we all admitted they were overpriced and bad quality, we would all feel a bit more comfortable. Maybe if we stopped staring at other people and comparing yourself to them, as if we were a diagram or an application, we could look at our skin and love it a bit more. The words uttered by the very people he called his friends, the people he could trust, which cut so deeply into his soul, wrenching and eating away at him until there was nothing left, were thrown like a knife at the wall. Careful, methodic, and meticulous. Thrown so very hard to be sure the boy hears, with the intent to maim and scar, and tear down the walls that were so carefully built by his own hands. And beneath all of that scarring and hurt, there's more of a man than the boys he faced earlier. A man who stands up for women, a man who does everything he can to stand up against the wind. The third time we asked ourselves this is when we're entering high school. Some of us could buy a whole new role wardrobe, but some of us were just driving for mittens for the winter. When we chose our classes, we were a bit afraid because who would want to be in a class that none of your friends were in? If we had good or great grades, we'd be known as nerds. If we had trouble and not so good of grades, we'd be known as dumb. If he played sports, he'd be called a jock. If he understood woman gay. If she's had more than one boyfriend, slut would be our no name. If she rejected anyone, the word boring would slip out. So we didn't really know what society wanted from us. You were trying to balance school, your after school activities, plus a bonus of your social life to make sure you had a bit of character. Now, let's not forget the late nights FaceTiming your loved ones or the late night yells of your parents because they're trying to pay for after school activities. Once you hear them start, you end your FaceTime. A man who defends what's right and fights to keep the right things alive. A man who only tries to please everyone and when he doesn't, he takes it upon himself. A man who is strong who had built up so many defenses against this very thing happening to him, and yet it was so quickly torn down. The fourth time we asked ourselves this is when you're ending high school, joining in ACTs and college applications. However, you know more. You've learned more of this terrible world. You grew stronger. A seed will turn into a flower. A child can turn into a legacy. However, the seed and child are closer than you think. The seed grows in the bones of the Hispanics, in the bones of the slaves, in the bones of Native Americans, in the bones of who fought just to speak. But it was only a joke, right? Who are you? Thank you, guys. Thank you. It's like a lot of wisdom coming out today. I'm really, really touched. Um, Georgia Ressmeyer. Hi. Um, first, a quick announcement. Um, I'd like to invite you all to a poetry reading a week from tomorrow. That's Sunday, October 8th. And it's at uh, the Paradigm uh, Coffee and Music at 1202 North uh, 8th Street, just a few blocks north of here. Good food there, good you know, coffee and tea and so on. Um, and the poetry reading starts at 2 o'clock, and it features um, Marilyn Zelke Windau, Marianne Hurt, Smokey the Bear over here, and, <laughs> and me, I'm Georgia Russmeyer, I live in Sheboygan. And it will be emceed by everybody's favorite MC, Lisa Vijos. Oh, yeah. um, we'll read for maybe an hour, and then we, there is an open mic, and we encourage people to come and read for the open mic. That will probably start around 3 o'clock. Um, I'm going to read a pretty short poem, and it is about what a sunset can teach us about economic justice. It's called Gold at Day's End. Windows and trees gilded like facades and artifacts of palaces, churches. Inestimable riches in twigs, leaves, that never asked to be so grand or blessed. Who have the best of gold without a need for guards or preservation. Whose grasp on wealth is open-palmed as from these spill coins that melt to crown the tallest trees last. 
which gladly glow, then throw their riches west to where the sun's low rays still glint of gold. True wealth just passed along, not seized or hoarded. this little speech. I hope I have the courage to, to say it. Um, my father is 91. He is on his final journey. He went to Rocky Mill a couple months ago. He lives there. They're a fantastic place. Um, but it's, it's not easy. It's mostly very hard. And um, this morning, it was a good day, though. And so I live for those moments of grace. This is a little high. Can we, can we put it down? Okay, good, thank you. Um, the poem I'm gonna read is not about him, but he's in it. Uh, I wrote this when I was 17 years old, um, my first year of college, uh, and I talked about it last year, the only poem I've ever written before or since, but it won an award <laughs> in this little Artful Dodger magazine. I won $10. And, <laughs> And I look back at this poem 42 years later, and I'm thinking, it's about my 92-year-old grandfather, my father's father, who is, was in much better health then than my father is now at 91. I'm thinking, why was I writing about aging at 17? But I think, I think I recognize the irony of this situation. It was about actually five or six years before. We used to go on these annual visits to Pennsylvania to visit old Pat, my grandfather in Pennsylvania. Coal mining town, very impoverished. It was a shack. He had these coffee cans that he used to spit tobacco in. So as a kid, I was, of course, fascinated by that. Um, but I was fascinated by other things, the relationship between my father and his father, the adults, the children. So I'm reading this for the first and only time, or at least the first, first time, anyway. It's called Yearly Visit. Oh, before I started. Um, the only reason I have the courage to do this and to keep writing after this is because I just attended a five-day retreat, a writing retreat, sort of to get myself away from the situation for a while. And the thing, the, you could summarize what I learned in this retreat in one sentence. Writing is self-care. Writing, just the process of writing, never mind the outcome. The process of writing is self-care. So those of you inspired by these amazing poems, just try it. And to that end, I'm starting my own Western Sheboygan County writing group in my home in Elkhart Lake. If you're interested, take one of my cards. We're gonna start the first week in November after a play I'm in is over. Um, email me and I'll let you know the time and place or we'll work it out together. We're gonna start out drinking coffee and wine, write for a half hour, 
I mean, I'm sorry, coffee and tea, right, for a half hour, and then break out the wine and share whatever we want to share. Very low key. For me, it's a good time. If it's a good time for you too, contact me afterwards. Okay, here's the poem. Yearly visit. Coffee can spittoons clutter stained floors. Musty, damp smells linger in the rooms, which are lined with the faded portraits of his long dead wife and son. In the kitchen stands the old stove on whose door my dad used to sit as a boy and tie his shoes before rushing off to school, says old Pap, every time we come, but not before, you want some ice cream? Outside, the rusty lawn chairs encircle the old elm. He lounges here, as he does all summer, when not inside watching TV. Did you see the pirates take the rent, he asks. Baseball talk and neighborhood gossip. Complaints about the weather. 92 years old and he's still mobile, has a full head of white hair, hazy blue eyes, spits tobacco occasionally. Doesn't talk too well, but he doesn't have much to say anyway, according to Aunt Marie. Children such as I once was, steering, laughing, can't wait to get away, afraid of him. Adults, his children, mocking, scolding, bossing, borrowing his savings. He shakes his head and looks down, powerless to the youngsters, ashamed of his feebleness. His eyes show nothing. No more to say, Dad starts the car and we follow. First, Pap presses a wrinkled bill in my hand. Buy yourself some candy, he said for 12 years now. An attempt at a wink, the familiar Hungarian smile, and a wave. He blinks at the sun's reflection on shiny chrome as we quickly pull away in our Cadillac. Thank you, Thank you Nanette, reminding us that writing is self-care. What I'm going to do, it is it's just a tiny bit after two, and we have a, our featured reader was, is scheduled to start at two o'clock. So we're going to, um, I'm going to introduce him and invite him up to read, and then we'll um, weave in the rest of the open mic reader. So I hope you can stay a little bit yet. Um, Scott is looking frustrated. <laughs> can you stay? Maybe? Okay. Okay. Um, let me so let me introduce our featured reader. Let me find my sheet of paper. One moment. Roberto Harrison. Roberto Harrison's books include Oz, Counter Demons, Bicycle, Culebra, Culebra, Bridge of the World, and many chapbooks. With Andrew Levy, Roberto edited the poetry journal Canyon from 1997 to 2008. And he's also the editor of Bronze Skull Press, which has published over 20 chapbooks, including the work of many Midwestern poets. Most recently, Roberto served as one of the co-editors for the anthology Resist Much, Obey Little, Inaugural Poems to the Resistance. And I, I have the book, I forgot it by my chair, but it's okay, it's very large, it's a fabulous anthology, and. Where I'm giving a copy of it to the library, so it will be on, will be available here. It's an amazing collection of poetry about resistance to the, to whatever is going on right now in our world. Anyway, Roberto was one of the editors of this anthology, and he's also the poet laureate of Milwaukee for 2017 through 2019, and he's a visual artist. So he lives in Milwaukee with his wife, Brenda Cardenas, who's also a poet and also one of the editors of the anthology. And she's here today. So please give Roberto a warm Sheboygan welcome, everyone. Okay. Thank you for having me, uh, Lisa. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try to read for about 20 minutes. Can't you can't hear me? Oh, you need to go off. Straight into Okay. Now can you hear me? Okay, I gotta figure out how to talk into this thing. More? Closer? Closer, like this. Like this? Okay. Okay, I'm gonna read for about 20 minutes. 
Thank you for having me. It's a lot colder in the shade. I'm totally underdressed. Um, new moon for ecology. I walked a thousand miles in the event of apocalypse. Barefoot and there, I found the horses to learn to breathe from. Deer reveal their wilderness to us as we wander, as we remove the tires that brought us here, the vacuous exception of dreams, the dreamless attention, the dream that holds all of us to the conflict that one sees in the heat and in the snow, the conflict of the dream that opens its own eyes, sobbing at the small darkness that will not comfort all of me. As I disappear, they will not believe without planes to be there, without the untold overabundance of meaning, of a chatter of a throng of bees, the bees that remember for us where the flowers are in this time of fires and weapons. The deathless becomes as close to execution as a careless wind does not remove the tree that settles through an arrival and departure to the sound of turmoil and the awful sensory panoramas that know no country, no escape. To the memories as they surface here, again they become like a sand, like the wilderness, emptied of its animals, which will return through the light of the bridge, though not as we can care for them again. Even the firing squad, the many-headed beast, beast of underlings, the serpent revealed to be my soul, in this mythos which is not a story, in this mythos which was based on fear but became something of love, the collapse of misunderstanding there, as a child I was to face an evil of the world from everywhere at once with no breathing room, and it came from me, and the cancer that will not subside to reveal the deer, the skin that I wear, the black deer as I am known to the cellar, in the poverty of light, of the people frequently diminished by simple signs. Those constellations have no meaning for me. That family is a set of pebbles on the ground, and I love them as I love the earth, but not more. You can see the head of the lamb arrive with me to the eastern shore, but the horseshoe crabs eternally deliver the devil mask since the beginning of time. I wear it now to step out of this world and to see it in my sleep, which will fill the soil with the voices of who is drawn to evil and who will merely learn from it. This, there is no end to the consciousness of abandonment, inside or out, as it extends further than the window's registries, enough so that we can continue to imagine past the collapse of the sun. Wars are fought for it, this occlusion, which is peace. Wars are fought for it because we confuse ourselves as the smallest node of the client. Wars will come of it because we have not seen clearly that only a small continent, a fraction of the network's blood, has been experienced by us in this world of absolute and constant assault of the silhouettes. Silence reveals the vast rents and unknowable vistas that enrich us, but we have no words and no ears for these. The inside was duplicated long ago due to a rigidness which confuses the sacred and the healing songs with weakness and material for the first rose of winter. I sang these songs and I saw these sacred things as my mind was dispersed through the, through the endless knots of hearts and the rise of a network agora and fully seen but now I've died to the uncountable, and I arrive to a place where these things and these songs, though still protected, become the light and the dark that I put together with the yoga of Panama to carry me there as a first and last Panamanian. And there, un there are uncountably many of us evenly spread across the universe of every color, every persuasion, every shape, speaking, every language of fire or of water, endlessly propagating to help us. I am here to help, and I am here to die again, to free myself from all of you with loving kindness and compassion, as the sun promises to be here tomorrow or not, 
as a moon reveals itself to be a new encircled sunrise. Get it said, amigos. Let fly the old fly. Let it come down like a storm of fearful rinpoches. What language remains at the end of my migration by playing alone as an infant back to Panama to forget always what were the tears that brought back the sloth, the coconuts flown to impoverish each conversation from the end of time as now? No towel there, but what I searched for, a combination in the ceiling marked by dots. I tried to gain entry into heaven, but did not. Angels have bargained for me that the sea will not replace her own animals with the ones I've met to, meant to bring from the light to arrive with the impoverished, always sent to negotiate troubles in the canal. My little voicing far away, it began with cocoyitos, a plain effort. Nature to mimic us now, computers will gradually disappear but the light remains now that our networks take on the work of survival. The flash entered into a slave machine. A caste system wades into water and saves itself from annihilation with annihilation. From the salt at the frozen trauma, like mine, will sever in its projectiles. The force field increases with the shelter that is destroyed, the hiding place from future heat and salvation. Remember that one serves to reveal the shattered image of true self-knowledge. The instantaneous errors of friendship that the moon ails to arrive at this, this tearing off of skin that, we, that will remain with the promises, the ritual entry of flags and prayers that the nest of snakes reveals to be one. There is no real survival value to practices, no real insight into the heart of the universe. Except that in blindness, I see the troubles that a single soul might make, a soul to be one and two, to eliminate the entrances and exits from the sphere of networks, which includes the entire universe. Some stopped writing because they had written their dreams so well. I cannot stop because I am just beginning to dream, just beginning to see through myself in the world, not so that I can so that I can become invisible to you again, but to write invisibly through my heart, the residence of my mind, evenly distributed throughout endless imaginations, oceans. I write the release of the night sky because my reptilian anchor, the frozen tundra of my traumas, will break off as ice flows, as the earth does now, and, we'll, and we will be one together to remake the poles, to place them elsewhere, to find a new constellation that travels with us to the end of monuments and compassion. And it's our own fault for not believing in the power of the wilderness, in the power of the ancients, of the imagination's seas. In the events of a bridge, which serves solely to manifest as a fourth form, Panama, its two yogas of the earth and of the waters, between the sea and the ocean, its many fishes that claim us to fly as butterflies. And remember that the Apostle Islands claim the capital of the Ojibwa here, in their residence, where the ashes of my past pass through into the lake of the pioneers and back to Panama. Cry again, for you shall see how the moments have split inside to deliver us from the possible of the extremes of the most noble exhaustion, the possible life of the extremes of the most noble exhaustion. Don't tell me again that there is a hierarchy from which we cannot remove ourselves. I've seen it. That breathing will bring it all together as I cannot breathe. I cannot breathe and I do not see. Kindness is a main objective. A wreck of salvation. A sunrise pierces an edge of the iron crowd it counts down to believe no action in the unformed. A retreat has opened, silent winter, long cuts through memory, extricating a tongue to find circles in the country of water seal. Keep it and speak again. 
through the floor of an arriving galaxy, the seal that sight is clear, resource, letter. Man of sorrows, where does it stop? All because of a thousand demonic giants and my attachment to them will not let them go till now. Fused to the memory of my fence, which no longer protects or savages in my winter link. I am angry at the planets that have shrunken into the empty husk of a long dead dog in the desert. There, remorsefully connected to the abolished, to the sound of a small refuge in a world of controls, accidents, new moon for the torturers. One more event on the horizon of my misunderstood monster. The reward of a plan of action that erases you, that makes you tremble like the mind that I have not yet gained forever. Not everyone else has a ground they built under them with homes and playgrounds, with a television that does not threaten them, with remorseless politics, but the few, the proud, the rewarded for being in a single place their entire lives. No, that's what love is to you. No, a piece of ground that you've worn so thoroughly that you feel as if you are part of the earth. But I am that earth, not you. I am that sun, not you. I am that moon that falls in the roof of your house to destroy the trees and your antenna, to destroy the medicines you think will gain me sanity because of the neutral collapse of my body, the charged fire of my immolation, the hatred that I spew for the loved ones of the world who betrayed me and who were never human, but they are. No, what country made you the same as that of my pharmaceuticals, the same as that of my imagined divinity, which knows no bounds beyond the rabbit, and which knows no bounds beyond the snake that keeps still and quiet beyond the sun. Silence does not fear. I smile when I see these words, yet I am not silent enough. To see the silence eclipse the sun. I must, it must be as a heart does within the ocean of a sea through sounds of La Pintada to make a whole meaning of it, which explodes on occasion, a self-exploding vision, sticks and stones and leaves. This I will be ready for. My body opened with the books of the worlds of the silent that I lick and read with my tongue of silence and sound, apart and together, apart and together again, to dream myself piercing through hatred into a snake again, a red and black snake followed from the forms of light that it breeds, the forms of light in the eternal world of the blind that do not consider and do not divide, a link to be more than flesh. Give up the view that will not square the circle. Give it up for the quaternary of every rain that harms you. I aim to be a dissolving witness, a faraway wilderness with a robust interface made of light, illusory, but made in the world of roads, while in my heart I have no roads, bewildered in the midst of the planets and their far away visits, of, and their far away visits, a self-sustaining soul in wilderness, one, with no time and no seeing, it breaks into what seems to be an absent world without a world except to the light. The last colors. Snowed in to the interior, mustard seed, grain of rice, formed and unformed radiations. A new sun beyond the poles makes a gift of itself to the unconditioned, a gift from no doctor. It's always there, burning through a song of cognition. Planes pass on the content of extermination. The West is ignorant of the world, but it believes in its totem, despite the ground that will never be owned. I am not, from any direction, 
because I have folded in on myself to attract wandering. There is no wandering profanity. There I eclipse my own visions with the elderly dreaming on their own. At least they dream. All plants must know that the earth now changes toward what was promised long ago in not returning to the absent interior of life. Know that our blood makes a mark on the world to signify a new mind of the moon, to symbolize through patterns and affections, to save again what the world was once. Horses of insight. I walk the woods after breathing quietly and seeing everything dissolve. Four times I saw the horses, one black stallion with a lightning bolt of white streaking down its forehead, and two brown mares. Each day I sang to them and showed them each of my hands. The first day all of them came to the fence to share with me their origins. The second day they were already at the fence when I arrived to fill the balls of light inside. The third day, a black cat with a lightning bolt of white on its chest came and played with me as the horses breathed quietly at a distance far away, but also on the inside of my heart. They were at the dividing line between each breath and carried my light from one breath to the next. The cat was happy as it was the night where morning must be born. The last day, the two mares waited apprehensively for me as a black stallion breathed upon the fence all things must cross and which divides him from the mares. I sang to them each day and each day showed them each of my hands. And on the last day, I fulfilled my promise to them that they would be the horses of my dream, that I would ride with them through all the lands that now arrive inside the breath. And as I said goodbye and left, I walked away and further on, I heard the hoofsteps in the trees I thought were deer, but it was them. The horses, as they see me now, revealed to be with them. Poetry in a time of war. Sometimes poetry becomes armor. It can be difficult to write poetry as a form of vulnerability, not only vulnerability to others, but also to the universe. Anything can be made into armor. Confession, the personal, politics, mythology, the everyday, views of nature, history, anything stylized and that rests during motion any angle. The same views can be used to allow us to be vulnerable, to be in motion and open, still and receptive. We can't stop at the merely personal or at the merely formal to make a poetry without armor. The deciding line is a line which makes an approximate symmetry of our bodies. This line is the equator that writes the world in all directions. I propose a poetry of vulnerability in a time of war. In, a time, in, any, in any time where the word belongs. We must imagine evil as a sound and a song of goodness in this poetry. The devil face is a mask we can wear to celebrate it. Only a struggle with the demonic delivers a link to a song. This vulnerability is not only to the illusory outside, but from the illusion of us to the illusion of us. It implies a vibrational communion with others and how words and phrases break open, like seas destroyed and created again in the coldness of space, then destroyed and created again in the volcanic origins of the earth. In this poetry, the illusion of self and other dissolves, if we can see it, and we usually can't, but we can come closer and closer to that fact through its breathing. The vulnerable poet delivers her words as they are spoken to us as well from other times and other places, growing in the present as two hands put together. Not only the utility, but the origin 
of the language that is being shared is under question. Did it appear as a miracle? Is muteness more true? Does it bind us to the world as water makes life possible? Its body becomes elemental and formless, able to mutate into any form and any spirit. It is the embodiment of silence. It is unity turned in on itself to be zero, resting there at the very beginning, unraveling in the light of the end. The vulnerable allows us to experience the red and black sound, the sound born of islands in the tropics and from the geometries of snow in a crushing winter, both tied together by the net. This sound is the blood of the black divine and the crisp cool night of collapse. It comes to us as a bridge between the senses. It erases limits to the mouth and moves a pregnant soul through the earth. It is the underground home for the rabbit that writes for mystery and for the snake that swallows the egg at the end of time. Vulnerability is non-conceptual. It is timeless and fills space. Its sounds are always incomplete and strive for wholeness. It implies that every discomfort, every pain grows into a beaming sun as the night sky is alive. Its satellites wander without aim. Its computation is a single table, dual, which aims to be a bridge of the world. It is symbolic as each gesture is symbolic and mythological as the only story ever told. It is psychic and psychotic as it moves to end war with the mind and makes love to everyone and everything eternally through a single body without a notion of self. It is repulsed from things when the true and the false arrive and stand fast in air of light. It overflows as all signs arrive to bring us a new communion, the whole in time that allows us to be free. The computer of vulnerability is an intermediate link between worlds. It is the ocean made plain and alive by the sky. It arrives as an egg in the palm of each poem. The circle of eternity the plains without roads in the woods of our home. The computer is a notion of toggles, and as a bridge makes the weather arrive, it bleeds for the body of the world. It is a start in the destiny of the word. It erases itself as poetry has erased itself and allows us to make the first full circle to belong to the earth as the weather changes to bring a first full meaning of our voice to the sands and the organs of life moved back and forth and on and off by the moon. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. Let's give our Milwaukee Poet Laureate, and let's give all of us who've read already a hand in those yet to read, which next up is Scott Schmidt. Roberta, thank you. I have no idea how one is supposed to follow something like that. <laughs> so, we all have our own art forms and, and the things that inspire them or the catalyst that cause us to take thought and put it on paper. As I get older, I tend to notice things more and I'm learning to write about moments in my life. And when I talk about moments, I mean not like, hey, I went to an afternoon and I had a great dinner and there was hours and hours and hours of fun. So there's really tiny moments that we tend to ignore or forget that if we just took a second to really think them through, might have significant meaning in our lives. So, um, this poem was very simply titled The Man. It was written about an hour and a half after I had this experience outside of a quick trip in uh, New Holstein, Wisconsin. He wore the overwide dark sunglasses of an old man whose eyes had seen too much. Too much sunlight, too much disappointment, too much loss. Too much of himself as he is now versus the way he used to be. His gait was unsteady. And he used my car as a banister as he shuffled towards the curb, wavering a bit as if the wind were buffeting him from both sides simultaneously. Stopping just short of the curb, he stood for a moment, 
vacillating. And as I stood there waiting for him to pass, I thought for a second he might turn back. To my surprise, he did not. Instead, with the stoic uncertainty of one who has become accustomed to a body that now spoke a language foreign to that of the brain used to command it, he raised one foot, using it as a feeler. He pawed at the air in front of the curb, searching once, twice, three times, standing again, vacillating. I asked, gently, so as not to pour salt on the wounded pride of a man whose life experiences undoubtedly outweighed my own. Do you Without looking in my direction, he volleyed my soft serve with a question of his own. Is there a curb there? Yes, sir, there is, I replied, and put my arm out for him to grasp. Never taking his eyes off of where he wanted to be, he reached out his hand, accepting my offering. His grip was firm. He took a second with his hand on my arm, mustering his own strength, borrowing some of mine, and then placed his foot on the curb and stepped up. One more shuffling step, two, pause. Are you good? I asked him. Yes, thank you, he said, and unceremoniously resumed his shuffling gait, this time towards the door of the establishment to which he sought entrance. I watched him go, in part to make certain he arrived at his destination safely, and in part because for a brief moment I couldn't help but see a bit of myself in the form of that old man, 30 years from now, with the same unsteady shuffling gait, the same stoic uncertainty, and with that small glimpse at one of a plethora of possible future me's, I wondered if someone would be there, standing at the curb, when I arrived. Thank you. How's everybody doing? No, it's cold. Well, all right, but poetry is warming us up, right? Yes? Okay, so if you need to move around and like feel free, go stand in the sun, shake it up a little. Okay, Sunshine Lee. Hello everyone, I am Sunshine Lee and I'm a student from North. And this is my poem. Closer. Closer. There okay. <laughs> there is more to humans than meets the eye. At first glance, you will see that we fight, we steal, we cheat, and we lie. But if you stay long enough to get to know us, you will also see that we love, we help, we share, and we stand up in the face of injustice. We are humans, capable of terrible destruction and enormous compassion. It is an ongoing war that we each must face in our lives. Like a sailor lost in a sea storm, we are fighting every moment just to make it back home. And even though we have lost battles, we have yet to lose the war. There will be days where our faith fails us, days where our allies turn into our enemies, days where all hope has vanished into the storm, but the day will never come where we forsake this earth and turn our backs on its people. Our races are united by history so that we may stand to save the future together. We all possess the power to be heroes, if only we had the courage to try. Through the blood, sweat, tears, we are the living, the breathing, and the persevering human legend. And at the heart of each great myth, there lies our truth. Pardon us. Can you come? Um, instead of reading my own, I, I wanted to bring a poem by um, one of my very favorite poets, who was our poet laureate um, from in 2015 and 2016, Juan Felipe Herrera. And this is his poem, Poem by Poem. In memory of Cynthia Hurd, Susie Jackson, Ethel Lance, Reverend DePayne Middleton, Dr. Honorable Reverend Clementa Pinkney, Taiwanza Sanders, Reverend Daniel Simmons Sr., Reverend Sharonda Singleton, Myra Thompson, 
shot and killed while at church, Charles, Charleston, South Carolina, 6-18-2015, rip. Poem by poem, we can end the violence every day after every other day. Nine killed in Charleston, South Carolina. They are not nine. They are each one alive. We do not know. You have a poem to offer. It is made of action. You must search for it, run outside, and give your life to it. When you find it, walk it back, blow upon it, carry it taller than the city where you live. When the blood comes down, do not ask if it is your blood. It is made of nine drops. Honor them, wash them, stop them from falling. Juan Felipe. And uh, Haley, sir, I don't know how to say your last name. Is Haley still here? So I'm Haley Grinke. And I'm from North High and part of the Poetry Club. And this is my <laughs> So I'm from North High, and I'm part of the Poetry Club, and this is my poem, Forbidden Love. It all happened so fast. One second I'm winning, the next I've lost. Smashed into the cold, hard ground. This is it, I think, with no tear in my eye or sadness in my heart. Then you came. Standing strong, you took the hit, saving my life. The life of a monster. I tried to fight you, untrusting of your good intentions. I have been stabbed in the back before. You fought me, untrusting the creature of nightmares. I began to see you in light. I began to care, and so did you. We were in a dance of questions, spinning and twirling a never-ending cycle, trying to figure the other out, and we did. Happy, yes, happy. You taught me how to feel joy. You taught me what it means to truly live. You taught me love. I taught you to never judge a book by its old, warm, and jagged cover. I taught you how to love. Then it came, the pain. This is it, I tell you. This time, I'm sad. I've lived for so long without knowing the beauty of this world. And you, you taught me to see its magnificence. I don't want to leave it, but I must. You may think me human, but I am still cursed from birth. This world I love is not mine. This world is not meant for us. Goodbye. I have accepted it. Please, shed no tears for me. Find someone better. Please, don't feel sorry for me. Save it for another. This is it, my love. Jerry Birch. This is for Connie, who has received a sentence that her cancer will take her in the next three to six months. This tiny sip, little bird, a finch, I think, landed on the bird bath, took a sip of the universe then flew off to who knows, who knows where. The rain that filled the bird bath came from eternity. The little bird's life is but a mere piece of forever. A tiny grace here only for a moment. This minute taste of infinity where we also briefly dwell, sparkles with joy and pain, burns bright for an instant, then disappears without a sign. We stay a while too, then fly away to the worlds where yellow birds meet to pass along the wisdom of eternity and a day. It's relevant now because of Ken Burns' Vietnam War. 
It's just concluded on Thursday. And I thought it was very interesting that the very end featured a poet. Reading free verse. He didn't speak of the glories of battle or patriotism. He focused on the soldiers. He focused on their protracted march. One foot in front of the other. And finally ending with the words, they endured. I've always wondered, how do you choose the last words in a documentary? And now, and uh, I thought it was very appropriate and moving for him to focus on the soldiers on both sides and say they endured. I'm going to read, uh, perform my poem, which has as inspiration Robert Frost's and stopping by the woods on the snowy night. It wasn't the content, it was the rhyme scheme. A, A, B, A, B, B, C, B, C, C, D, C. One stanza was linked to the next by a rhyme. I have a visual aid. Whose boots these are, you'll come to know, was just an average G.I. Joe. A mother's son just turned 19, and then the far off war did go. And in war's chaos, his life careened from vibrant youth to death obscene. His helmet, armor, rifle, all negated by an ambush, sudden mayhem unforeseen. A folded flag, a bugle call, some tributes bestowed when soldiers fall. A clenching throat and tearing eye are what his mourners shall most recall. I was there. I saw him die. <laughs> it scarred my soul, which questions why I should live, but he did die. <laughs> God, when, how will I find peace? Epilogue. Yes, the survivor yearns, aches for peace, prays for peace. And so should we all. But what to pray, how to pray? Simply, from the heart, saying, Eternal Father, bless and protect us all, and fill us with grace, the grace that will empower and sustain us in the quest for peace, a peace that, a quest that has no end. But now, this moment's end has come, so let us go in peace and love and hope, saying together, so be it, so be it, amen. Thank you.
Thank you, Frank. Um, we have two poets yet to come, and then we're going to shift into some music. So let's have Mary Kozan. Like Scott, this is an issue of how do I follow Frank. Um, it, what I've been put together is called change. And I had an idea that it would be kind of lighthearted, and it kind of morphed into a poem, but maybe like a sermonette. Change is hard. Change isn't hard. Uh, when I got my winter pants, long pants out a couple of weeks ago, they were snug. So I got new pants. The other night, when I was fixing supper, I discovered we were out of frozen corn. So I got corn chips to have with supper as my vegetable. Not long ago, I saw a young boy being bullied, and I turned around and went the other way. Change is easy. Change, when it's easy, isn't always the right change. It isn't always the right choice to make. Those pants were a sign I needed to do something to make a change. Exercise and diet, yeah. Ooh. The the pant, the lost or the uh, empty bag of frozen corn was a sign I needed to find another vegetable, a real vegetable, not corn chips. They don't come. And seeing that boy being bullied, I needed to do something, say something. Make that hard choice, that hard change. That easy change isn't always, isn't usually the right change to make. We need to find the strength in our hearts. We need to find the strength in our bodies, in our souls, to make that harder change, the better change for good. Thank you. So before we have our last poet, I do want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank the library, Mead Public Library, for hosting us today. All the, yes, applaud the library. It's a wonderful library. And especially, I want to thank my colleague and friend, Jeannie Gartman, for all she did to help make this day happen. I want to thank all the teachers from North and Etude and everyone who came out from far away, De Pere, Milwaukee and elsewhere. So, thank you all. And on that note of thanks, I want to invite Dalini Vang. So, um, the poem I'm going to read is called, If I Kept You. If I kept you, I would have been able to hold you in my arms and feel each of your tiny little fingers and tickle your toes. If I kept you, I would have been able to treasure you like an old music box left in the attic collecting dust. If I kept you, I would have been able to watch you grow and say your first word and your first crawl, see so your first fall to your first walk. I would have been able to if I had kept you, and I didn't. I didn't. I let you bleed from my body and allow you to kick and claw my stomach with whatever little strength you had, which was equivalent to none because you were only as big as a tiny bouncy ball, and I allowed myself permission to weep, but I knew that deep should be the one to ask you if I could. If I could shed these unworthy tears and sleep with my eyes wide open with crusted tears. If I could go through boxes and boxes of tissues because my sleeves were too wet and I couldn't find the trees to give me the oxygen to breathe. If I kept you, I wouldn't have known what to do. But I could have learned and yet selfishly I chose not to and decided I wasn't able to without first trying to. And because I wouldn't and came up with excuses, I dug myself a hole to lie in. Because if you were in one, the least that I could do was lie next to you. Now, thank you, Bellamy. Okay, this is brings to completion the poetry part of our afternoon together. Um, I do want to invite back to the stage for some music, John Dahl. When I first met John, 
he was returning to his hometown of Sheboygan after a long time away, mostly in the Pacific Northwest. And by day, John had worked for the United Way and uh, went and established the charitable organization in London, where he lived for two years before coming home to Sheboygan in 2013. And along the way, John has taught guitar and songwriting. Um, he taught at the University of Washington in Seattle. And he once, he said he made his way across America singing and playing music in from coffee house to pub to hotel lounge. He's played gigs in England, in Glastonbury, and the Avebury Solstice Fest. Where is John? He returned, oh, there, <laughs> I don't want to look at you. He returned to Sheboygan four years ago to marry his junior high sweetheart, Jane, and she's over there, and retire, which is when his career as a songwriter began in earnest. And John recently won the songwriting competition at the Cedarburg Cultural Center's annual Bluebird Cafe, which has been described as Wisconsin's largest and most eclectic open mic, but clearly they have not come here to our open mic. That's okay. John has a new CD, and uh, as luck would have it, he has it here for sale, so check it out. But now, please give me a give a warm welcome back to John Dahl. This is, 
this closes up at, at three, right? Yeah, so this will be my last one, right? Let's see if a couple people have already fallen over frozen on the ground. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you all for coming today.